Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the social credit system. People, I think, see this in Canada. I I don't know how people aren't all up in arms on what's going on, um, but they may still think that that well, that can't happen here. Can we talk about right. what's happening? Right. Well, it's already it's already happening here. Uh, you know, last year I wrote this piece for Barry Weiss about. Uh, that financial platform would be the next wave of online censorship. I mean, I was worrying about this last year because PayPal, but I helped found, you know, but we sold many years ago. It's now under new management. Um, they are working with partisan left-wing groups like the ADL and the SPLC to define lists of individuals and groups who they deem to have, you know, extremist or unacceptable views, and they're denied access to uh, PayPal accounts. And there are other financial institutions who are following suit, uh, the collective effect of which is to shut people out of the financial system. And if you think it's bad to deny people the right to free speech and to participate in the online marketplace of ideas, how much worse is it to deny them access to the new economy, to the way that they can buy food and medicine and other products for their families? Uh, you know, it is really a, a very severe form of punishment and social control. And, you know, that is what we're talking about. When we talk about a social credit system. We're talking about a system that, you know, sort of pretends to allow political dissent. It doesn't just send you to the gulag, but it conditions your ability to access the economy and the benefits of society. It conditions that on having the correct views, on having the acceptable views. And, you know, what did Justin Trudeau do? He declared right out of the gate that these protesters had unacceptable views, and then he proceeded to uh, freeze their bank accounts and to shut off anybody who might contribute to them. That is really terrifying. The way the way he said, you know, we're going to we're going to shut down their accounts, we're going to close the off ramps for Bitcoin. It's not only them, but it's anybody who donated to them or quote helped them. The, That's right. That, That's right. Anybody 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 who was quote indirectly directly or indirectly involved in the protest was now subject to this this law in the you know this emergencies act that he invoked uh, without really proper uh, basis and you know anyone who you know quote unquote provided property to help facilitate the protests could now be swept up in the dragnet and so it's not just if you're say you know one of the organizers uh, of of the protest but if you're you know a little old grandma somewhere and you want to contribute twenty five dollars so that you know a trucker really a poor destitute trucker can buy a hot meal or some fuel to keep themselves from freezing at night. If that's your intent to make that donation, you can still be swept up in this and you can have your bank account frozen. And one of the you know incredible things about it is not just this unprecedented extension of aiding and abetting liability, but also that it's retroactive. That you know, grandma who made the contribution at the time she did it, it was completely legal. And yet under this order, she can now have her account frozen as punishment. And so what, what is the point of this? It is to signal, and there's going to be a chilling effect in the future, that even if you make a completely lawful donation to a political cause, if, that, if Justin Trudeau doesn't like that cause, if he thinks there are quote-unquote unacceptable views, that he has the power, that he can invoke the power at some point in the future to freeze your bank account, even though what you did is legal today, that is the precedent they've created. And I think the result of that must be a chilling effect on political dissent. Oh, big time. They're, they're um, you know, also including insurance companies. I mean, he took their license away, their license to do business, their trucks away, their insurance away, uh, and their, uh, their banking, having them debanked, and then said, even when this is over, banks might want to consider not doing uh, business with these people. So basically, I mean, they're lepers, Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they're really creating a, a, a case of, of, of untouchables there in Canada. I mean, like you said, they're they're towing their trucks or confiscating them. The mayor of Ontario even said, let's sell off these trucks. We've seized them. Now sell them off. We're going to use them to pay our bills. Uh, they want to give these guys a criminal record so they can never work again. They've taken away their insurance. They've taken away the regulatory license. They, and then on top of that, because anybody who helps them who contributes to them can themselves now be frozen. No one's going to want to help them. So, so what, what happens to those people, David? What happens to them? 
You cut people's you cut people's um, money off. You, you how do you survive? They're they're creating a a, a group of destitute and desperate people. And, and you have to wonder for what? I mean, the COVID pandemic is is on the way and it's at an end. Even as Justin Trudeau was invoking these emergency powers, the you know, a number of the provinces were ending COVID mandates. They got the message. He never got the message. It's this extreme intolerance. I, you know, I, I have news for you, though, David. I, I don't, I, you know, even if it was waning, I, I mean, I watched um, uh, Occupy Wall Street. I was in New York during Occupy Wall Street. As long as you're not breaking the law or destroying property, you you have a right to do that. I never said we should sweep those people up. That's craziness. That's craziness. And I should be even stronger on the people I disagree with. I should fight for their right more than my right. Because who will fight for mine? Exactly. I mean, this is absolutely about the right of, of people to be able to engage in, in speech and in political expression and to pro- have the right to protest against their government. And these were almost entirely peaceful protests. Um, there was no violence. And yet Trudeau instantly denounced all the protesters as basically being terrorists. You know, uh, what about terrorists? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which allowed them. To apply these anti-terrorist laws to you know to freeze their bank accounts, the the, the most extreme forms of um, you know the, the most extreme powers that the government has, which is to act on a terrorist threat, were thereby invoked to really go after these ordinary you know working class men and women. We're talking to David Sachs. He's the founding COO of PayPal, and he is warning about the coming social credit system. Uh, that is in Canada, and do we have time to stop it here? You know, one of the things, David, that I found um, even at, well as shocking is the fact that there was a hacker who went in, hacked, took all of these names, doxed everybody, and the media published them and started humiliating them uh, and pillaring them in public. <laughs> That's right. And it, it had real consequences. There was a owner of a gelato shop who was exposed as having made a small contribution to the protesters. That they got so many threats, they had to shut down their shop. There was a low-level uh, government employee who donated a hundred dollars. She was fired from her job because of that. So there's been real reprisals based on that hack. And you know, I'm old enough to remember when social media cited as the reason they wouldn't publish the, they, that they would suppress the Hunter Biden stories for the election, that it came right. from hacked material. Right. Where, where was that policy implemented today? Right. Um, you know, this was, this was a, a legally obtained material and the press just reported it. So David, you know, I don't know if you're up on ESG, but that is, that's what um, Trudeau has done without the emergency order. Um, if you fall out of line with, E, S, or G, uh, you're going to be debanked um, or you will start to uh, feel the heat of the banking and uh, financial and insurance system. Uh, How far away from this system are we to have a, a true credit score? Do you see this happening sooner rather than later? And what do we do to stop it? Yeah. Well, this is my main concern is, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not a Canadian and, you know, I watch with sadness of what's happening over there, but ultimately yeah. it's going to be up to Canadians to govern themselves. What, what I'm mostly concerned about is the precedent that Trudeau has set that progressives here in America might look to and implement. And let's identify the elements, the ingredients of this toxic stew that already exists over here. First of all, you've got big tech companies like, you know, my alma mater, PayPal, have been freezing accounts based on, you know, working with partisan political groups to, you know, to shut people out of the financial system. That practice is already taking place. Second, you've got state of emergencies in states like California, where I live, where the governor is still operating under a state of emergency. He has invoked emergency powers that never seem to end, even though we just had a Super Bowl where 30,000 people were sitting, you know, elbow to elbow without any masks on, yet we're still in a state of emergency. Third, we have recently the Department of Homeland Security has now defined misinformation about COVID or the election 
to be a contributor to the terrorist threat level. So in other words, misinformation, in their view, can contribute to terrorism. So we have now all the ingredients where you have politicians invoking fake state of emergencies. You've got big tech companies shutting people out of the political system. And you've got this very scary and dangerous redefinition of terrorism to effectively apply to domestic political dissent. So you have all the ingredients there that Justin Trudeau was able to seize on. And all you're really lacking is the emergency necessary to invoke those powers. Um, So that is what I'm afraid of is I see all the precedents coming together. Uh, But we have one thing in the United States that Canada doesn't have, which is a rich constitutional tradition. We have – the protections under the Constitution. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that our Supreme Court would protect us against um, a, you know, an authoritarian attack on our liberties this way. However, there are many in our you know, political system who want to pack the Supreme Court as it stands today. And, and what would happen if the Supreme Court were packed? They would water down these rights and liberties and protections that we have. I think this is an issue that supersedes all others. You know, any political candidate who would give support to packing the Supreme Court should be instantly rejected, I think, by everybody across the political spectrum. And furthermore, I would say, you know, uh, Biden has a SCOTUS pick coming up. The Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee should make this topic number one. What do they think about the use of these authoritarian powers, these fake state of emergencies? Let's hear from them. You know, I don't think Republicans are going to be able to stop the SCOTUS pick, but let's put them on the record and, um, and discuss this issue. Are there any other people that uh, have this point of view that is they're in your business, they're in tech? I mean, it feels like uh, as the average person, it feels like we are just up against this monolithic monster. Yeah, I mean, Glenn, it's uh, it's rather scary. I mean, I'm definitely an outlier in the in the tech industry. You know, I've been involved in the tech industry for over 20 years. Uh, first as a founder, now as an investor. And I can tell you that there are other people who do share to one degree or another my concerns about civil liberties. I mean, I think it does extend across the political spectrum. However, they definitely feel intimidated into silence. Um, They believe that there will be reprisals for speaking out. And so I would say I'm not alone in my views, but there aren't too many people speaking out, and and that's, that's pretty scary. Not that you would care at this point, but have you have you paid a price for it? Um, you know, not that uh, not that I can tell. I mean, I would say. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm at. A, but but here's the thing, Les. I'm at a stage in my career yeah. where I don't have to worry about it. You know, yeah, um, if I never made another time, frankly, I'd be fine. So right. for me, speaking out is the most important thing. And you know, if it costs me some business that I don't know about, then so be it. Yeah. You know. Um, but so, but so, so, so far I've been, I've been fine. And, you know, what I'm trying to do, I've, I've participated on this podcast called the all in pod with a few friends in tech. Well, you know, one of the main reasons why I've spoken out is to show people that you can speak out and, uh, and they should have a little bit more courage in doing so. Um, because I don't think the majority of people across, you know, across the political spectrum want to see our civil liberties eroded this way. I think it is a bipartisan issue, certainly for uh, Republicans, independents, and I'd say even many Democrats. But there is a hard political left, the, the sort of the progressive left, that is driving all of this. And one of the reasons why they're successful at driving this is because moderates will not, they're too afraid to speak out and yeah. oppose it. Yeah. So I don't think there's a majority, but they are driving the agenda because no one will speak out against it. And it's really a very hypocritical agenda because – I mean, these people, you look at Trudeau, his self-conception is completely at odds with the reality. I mean, he claims to be saving democracy, preserving democracy, even as he is invoking you know, authoritarian powers. He claims to be the defender of the little guy, of the working class and the disadvantaged, while you know, crushing these you know, poor working class truck drivers under the sort of heel of, of his government. Yeah. Um, you know, they claim to be on the side of diversity and tolerance while – insisting that there's only one acceptable point of view and, you know, censoring all the alternatives as misinformation. So, you know, these, this, this hard progressive left is completely hypocritical. Um, I don't think most people support it, but they're kind of running unopposed right now because people are so afraid to speak out. 
David, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for being on the program. Um, I hope uh, I hope we can have you on again. God bless you and, and all the things that you're doing right now. David Sachs, founding COO of PayPal, founder and general partner of Craft Ventures. If you see what he has invested in, uh, he is on the cutting edge. And God bless him for speaking out. Wait, he produced the movie Thank You for Smoking? That's a great movie. How did we not talk to him about that? I don't know. Hopefully we'll have him back on. He's, right. he's great. 